so, hello. Uh, my name is Stephen Little. Um, you're at the Pearl Oasis. It's January 16th, and this is where we are. Um, <coughs> my talk is called Untitled Number 12, and actually the reason behind that is <coughs> Chris asked if I would give a talk, but I didn't want to commit to a topic. So um, I counted up how many other talks I'd given over the past couple of years, and they came out to 12. So, or rather 11, so I thought, Untitled Number 12. Um, that's being by Ma Mark Rothko, also entitled Untitled Number 12. Um, so the theme, as was stated in the abstract, is uh, random thoughts, code-induced hallucinations, and incoherent ramblings. Um, so this is basically a collection of uh, sort of things that I've been playing with lately. Um, uh, different modules that I've been either writing myself or, or contributing to and things like that. So, it'll include, among other things, uh, Redboard. Redboard is a dependency injection framework. Uh, I created a couple of years ago. I haven't actually had much time to actually use it for real um, until recently. Um, and what dependency injection is, uh, a lot of the Java guys like it. And it's, the best description I've heard of it is it's the inverse of garbage collection. So. With garbage collection, all your destructors for your objects are taken care of for you. Everything's neat, everything's cleaned up in the end. Uh, breadboard is the inverse. It does that for your constructors. So it constructs your objects for you, creates the instances for you, manages their life cycle, um, and uh, handles their dependencies. Um, so you can have you can build a lot of interdependent objects and not actually have to worry about or think about, well, how am I going to get from you know A so that I can have it for B? You can thread that all together with breadboard. Um, and actually, this is a catalog of Google Images. This is a breadboard, and actually, you know, the breadboard is anybody who did any electrical fiddling around, you know, what a breadboard is. So it's a it's a way to sort of prototype uh, a, a, a chipboard. That's a EEG machine, electroencephalo, whatever. Um, Electroencephalogram. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's a prototype for a brain uh, computer interface, um, and that was one of the first ones that came up on Google Images. So I love them. Uh, next thing I want to talk about, or one of the other things I'm going to talk about is Flack. Uh, Miyagawa here uh, created Flack. He uh, basically took all the good stuff from uh, Python, uh, WSGI, and Ruby's Rack and brought it over into Perl. Um, it's, uh, it's a relatively new project, but it's very exciting. A lot of people working on it. Uh, we're working to get the, um, all the other web frameworks uh, using it. So sort of the, the, the idea is we're going to get a nice core uh, web infrastructure that we can build uh, our frameworks on top of and potentially even more interoperability with that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Plaq has a concept, which it takes from Ruby and from Python, of middleware. And middleware is sort of this really uh, simple concept that you almost think, well, that's just too simple. Um, and that's, you, you just sort of wrap your application with this sort of onion skins around it uh, to create <coughs> Um, middleware. <laughs> I don't know the best way to describe it. You're sort of wrapping the functionality around your application. Um, and it, it's so far, the more I've played with it, it's uh, a really nice, really uh, clean way to sort of uh, build an application. I'm also going to talk about Path Router, which is Sean's favorite model. Sean has a competing model. Um, <clears throat> Path Router is uh, something uh, I got a Ruby on Rails book several years ago, and one of the cool things about it, or that I thought about Ruby was the, the way they uh, described the routes. So basically, here's the URL, here, you know, this is how you get to this controller and this action. Um, so I basically built path, path router for that, and one of the other nits that I have, um, have many, uh, is with Catalyst and with their UR, URI4 uh, method, which seems to sometimes work, it seems to sometimes not work, and it, it, it can be very finicky. So PathRouter... Fuck uh, you and file a bug then! <laughs> <laughs> PathRouter uh, uh, places reversibility is a very important thing. So what you put in uh, to PathRouter in, in terms of a route description, which is basically a hash rep, uh, you'll get the same uh, URL out and vice versa. So it, it's, it's always reversible and it, it, it places a lot of importance on that. Um, and that's just a personal preference. Um, and Moose, because I always talk about Moose. Um, so, and lastly, open source, and that doesn't turn out very well. So, one of the themes of this talk is that, you know, 
some of these modules I wrote, some of them other people wrote, some of them we stole from other language communities, um, some we borrowed from other language communities. There's a lot of uh, collaboration in open source, um, and there's a lot of actually just sort of stealing of good ideas. And that to me is one of the great things about open source and about the um, just sort of the, the, the culture that it creates around it is that it, it's, it's sort of this wonderful anarchy that just seems to work really well. And we all get to build our apps faster, uh, you know, reinvent the wheel less, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, open source, even though it's a little too weird, early to drink beer. So, um, I'm just going to do a quick thing. I, I, I saw this really good talk. Um, actually, I didn't get to finish watching it, but um, Avi Bryant, who uh, has created the Seaside framework, which is this sort of very interesting uh, small talk based um, web framework, he gave this talk um, about uh, great hackers steal. And um, he, in it, talked a lot about how uh, people should, or basically, that uh, computer hackers, and he had a nice little Venn diagram of here's all the computer hackers over here, and here's all the academics over here, and there was a very small cross-section of people who hacked on real projects and had to deploy to production, and who read and wrote computer science papers. Um, and if you've ever looked at a lot of uh, you know computer science papers, the software that's associated with them, if it works, you're lucky. If it still works, you're very lucky. Um, but most of the time, it's what I like to call academic abandonware. And it's basically written for the PhD thesis and then tossed aside. Whether it still works, whether it ever worked, is all irrelevant as long as they've got their article published, <laughs> everything's okay. <laughs> um, so that's very frustrating when you go and start looking around in those language communities for all this interesting stuff because you get all the software and it either doesn't work, it's got these great ideas, but it works or barely works or whatever. So um, Avi was talking about we need to really sort of get more of an intersection in that diagram where more hackers read more computer science papers and steal more good ideas and actually make them production worthy. So um, that's the Picasso quote, the great hackers steal, or great artists, no, uh, bad artists copy, great artists steal. Um, but there's also a Rodin quote, I invent nothing, I rediscover, which is sort of nice with it too. I didn't want to steal his quote. So, um, so I'm just going to run through a couple things that places where I've stolen stuff from um, and stuff that I think is really interesting. Um, so this book, uh, Types and Programming Languages, um, is a really interesting book, really difficult book, and very thick and in the mental sense uh, book, but it goes through a lot of uh, lambda calculus, which is one of the sort of foundational um, ideas uh, that, uh, just computability in general. Um, so it has all these really nice little examples of lambda calculus interpreters written on camel and sort of all this really interesting stuff. And you know, you get these great concepts uh, like the Y combinator, okay? It's not just a um, startup, uh, what do you call it? Not, not just Paul Graham. Um, so I'll explain this here. This is the Y combinator. So you have a function called Y, it takes a function uh, as its argument, um, and then produces what is that function applied to <coughs> Y applied to F again. If you start expanding this out and you start sort of uh, um, breaking it out, you'll see that if you know we were to see what this would look, what the execution of that would look like, it would be f uh, paren f paren y f. So this is the basis of recursion from a sort of a pure mathematical um, point of view. I'm not explaining it well. Um, I was a heart major, not a math major, so I'm probably screwing it up totally. But the point is, is that there's this really beautiful stuff, really interesting, beautiful stuff. It's not use, useful in your daily life, but it's interesting and it makes your mind think in certain ways. Um, small talk. Uh, you know, Avi Bryant, uh, the seaside guy that I mentioned earlier, he thinks small talk's still alive, but the reality is he's fairly pretty dead. Um, but there's also a lot of really great stuff to steal from small talk. Um, Steve Jobs stole the windowing system from small talk um, with Mac. So, uh, we borrowed a lot of stuff from small talk uh, for moves. So this is a really cool diagram of the uh, the basic class system and the meta object layer uh, in small talk. So uh, meta classes are actually instances of, of themselves. Uh, there's descriptions, behavior, object. That's sort of the, the, the chain that does it. You can see everything's got a uh, a complement. So that's the meta class. That's the regular class. 
So there's really these really interesting concepts written and worked out by really, really smart people that we can steal, that we can get all this stuff, and we can benefit from all their knowledge and sort of build on their shoulders. Um, this is uh, Haskell. Um, Haskell's sort of the cool academic language now. Um, this is one of my favorite little Haskell snippets. Okay. This is a, a type class. I won't get into what type classes are. It's sort of very weird and crazy. But the basic idea, it, it, it's not too far from OO. So if you sort of think of it in an OO sense. But it's the EQ, so equality. And because Haskell is so lazy, you can do really cool stuff. Like x is not equal to y is basically defined as not x equal to y. And y is equal to y not. It's obvious, right? But you could never write that in a, in a non-lazy language because it would never compile. It's too, it's too cyclical. Um, Haskell, you can't. You can actually define it that way. I don't know if they actually do in the, in the actual prelude um, for the Haskell compiler, but you can define it like that, and it'll actually work. It'll compile. Um, so interesting stuff like this. These are just sort of weird little ideas that are out there um, that are in these academic languages, in these sort of very esoteric languages that could have practical applications to us, all of us who have to actually deploy applications and write stuff that works and doesn't you know, infinitely recurse and things like that. Um, and everybody's favorite list. Um, you know, list, list has got just tons and tons of stuff to steal because it's, it's old. It's got a lot of uh, history in there. Um, and there's just all this sort of really cool stuff in list. Moose steals a lot from Kloss, the, the list framework. Um, so, I'll just go over this real quick. Uh, this is a, a very silly way to see if something is even or odd. Um, and it's a mutually recursive uh, function that basically you know, uh, keeps calling each other back and forth until it reaches zero, and then it tells you true or false based on whether it's odd or it's even. Um, you know, it's silly code, code, but it's very beautiful code. And it's very interesting code. You never use that in real life. You just, you know, modulus 2 is equal to zero, and hey, I found a number. Um, but this kind of stuff, you know, there, there's, there's, a, there's a clarity and a um, uh, sort of an elegance and a beauty to this kind of code that can bubble up into the practical every day. So this brings me to where we are today. We've got Moose, which I, let's see, I've got OCaml, Dylan, Haskell, Scala, um, Perl 6, Smalltalk, Java, Beta, Ruby, Clocks, so stole crap from all of them. Um, this is actually an old diagram of Larry's, where he talks about manuplexing and whip it up a tube. Um, and, and he has the, the, the more, um, <clears throat> the black parts, well, some of them are mine. Um, you know, Perl borrows a lot from C, borrows a lot from Shell, borrows from said and from off. Uh, Perl 5 started to borrow from Python for the object system, uh, Lisp for the, um, uh, the, the closures and things like that. So there's a huge history in the Pro community already of stealing all this good shit. Um, some of it from just plain old uh, Unix and stuff, but also now we're getting it from other places. And we're getting it from, from all these other languages. That I, and from, I, had, I love this picture. <laughs> um, so uh, Miyagawa has taken this to the next step and started borrowing from all these other communities. So um, he keeps in contact and sort of keeps, he keeps an ear out on all the, uh, the Rack stuff, the WSGI, which is Python, JSGI, and Jack, which is um, the JavaScript version of Rack and WSGI. Uh, WebOp.py is sort of um, what would you call it? Like a <coughs> parameter framework type of, yeah. Um, you know, there's all these great ideas and all the Rack middleware and the Python middleware. Um, there's all this great stuff out there that's just there for the taking. I mean, we're not really stealing. We're just taking it, we're bringing it over to our language. And, and getting the benefit, build, building on the shoulders, you know, getting the benefit, reusing more, um, not just on a code level, but actually on a conceptual level. Uh, all the pain that the early Rack developers went through, we don't have to worry about, because <laughs> we can steal what they've got now, several years later. Um, so, this brings me to uh, what I wanted to show, which, which starts to get into the code, um, and explaining some of those modules from earlier. So. Um, Matt, close your ears again, mm -hmm. please. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things, uh, a, a lot of what, what I do at work, uh, we do web applications, we do reporting systems, 
Um, and we end up building a lot of smaller applications that support these reporting systems in various ways, either early data collection stuff or, uh, you know, uh, you know, various, you know, extra apps that sort of sit around this. So I have a need at times to build very big, large, complex, flexible, and ridiculous reporting systems and applications like that. But I also I need to build these one-off quick apps that are, are small and lightweight and I can just quickly deploy and put out there. Um, so one of the things that's always bugged me about a lot of the web frameworks that are out there now, both uh, Perl and others, um, is that they either seem geared <coughs> one way or the other. They don't seem both. Uh, Catalyst is great, but if you want to do just a quick, fast, one-off application, it's actually, you, you almost write no code because you're just basically wiring a few things here and there, but it's all this boilerplate and all this extra stuff in there that Catalyst needs to run. And, you know, the concept of the model and the view, well, if I don't have a model, then who cares? Why do I need that in there? It's still in there. It's not really carrying any weight or anything like that, but it's just built for building larger web applications. Um, and then you have uh, things like CGI application, which is great for quick and dirty, get it out there, done, and it scales pretty well, but it hits a point where the complexity is not managed for you as it is in Catalyst. Um, so, I've been playing around lately. Um, it was an excuse basically to start playing with Plaque, um, uh, but I, and, and, and breadboard and all the other modules I mentioned earlier. Um, and the idea was just, well, let's see what we can do. Let's just make another web framework. That it's, you know, what did you say, Matt? It's one of the cardinal sins of a pro programmer. Web framework, uh, <laughs> templating system, and an ORM. So I haven't written an ORM in several years. Uh, <laughs> you'll see a little templating system sort of in here. Um, and, and it's definitely a bit of a web framework. Um, whether this ever gets released or anything like that, I'm not sure. I, it all depends on where it goes and how much more uh, I play with it or whether it ends up getting merged in with something uh, Matt and I were talking about last night, this and that. Um, so anyway, uh, this is a favorite quote of mine. Um, you know, whenever I'm building an application, I always try and think of this. Um, I don't want to put everything but the kitchen sink in there. Keep it simple. Keep it as simple as, as it needs to be, um, which sometimes means still very complex, but just don't add things for adding them for the sake of adding them. Take stuff away. Get it, try and refine it. Um, so, I have a fetish for large mammals, obviously, with moose. Um, this, uh, this experiment actually originally started last year, which was the Chinese Year of the Ops. Um, so I called it Ox, and I just like the name because it's quick and easy to type. Um, so uh, this is entitled Ox Application. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a sort of a little tour of it um, and use it as an excuse to explain some of the other modules that it's using underneath, like breadboard and path -power. So um, <clears throat> the essentially what Ox Application does is it sort of manages um, the, the mixture of path router and, and your, your routes for your web application, breadboard, which handles all the dependencies and, and wiring everything together, um, and plaque. Um, so your, your instance of an OX application can basically turn itself into a plaque application. Um, it already has a breadboard container within it that you can use to then uh, handle your dependencies and put it, wire everything together. Um, and it comes with a uh, with, with path router already in there. Um, that is not a uh, definite thing. I expect patches from Sean for path dispatcher. Um, uh, but you know, the idea is uh, I only chose path router because I like it and I use it. So, so oh sorry. Um, so uh, basically, all you have to write in here um, is, and you can sort of think of this as like the base of your application. Uh, this method is augmented in uh, Moose. I mean, what Augment does is um, it allows, uh, it's sort of like the inverse of uh, overriding, calling your superclass. Augment allows your superclass to actually call the subclasses, which is a little weird, um, but it actually works and it makes sense when, when you really get down into it. Um, so you're augmenting a set of breadboard methods because we actually put some stuff together for you um, already. So what goes in that little dot, dot, dot is our breadboard. <clears throat> um, definition. So we're going to cut off a little bit here in the bottom, but so I'm going to walk through the basics of this and sort of also try and explain uh, what 
uh, breadboard is and what it does. So um, breadboard is essentially a hierarchy of containers and services. Um, containers are really just namespaces. They're, they don't really serve <clears throat> much more of a purpose other than a place to hold uh, your services and, and a way to namespace them. Uh, so that you don't have a whole bunch of stuff on one layer. So the first one, so we're going to use a, a basic model view controller because it's fun to use and, and everybody gets it. And I'll have to go back and explain some other weirdness. Um, so we have a container for models, um, just because uh, good namespacing. Um, this basically says create a breadboard service, call it counter inside the model container, and what when you resolve the service, create an instance of counter over engineered model. Okay, and I'm using a, a counter because it's a really simple uh, application example, and I don't have to explain that either. Um, so. Uh, when you resolve that service, it gives you an instance. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, there's no dependencies on this. There's nothing like that, so you don't have to really get into much detail. But that's the simplest uh, breadboard service you can create there. Uh, we've got a view container. So one of the other things that I've been sort of reading a lot about and trying to steal from is uh, Coco, which is the um, Mac OS uh, framework. And the way they handle their uh, UI and the connection between their UIs, uh, they call them nibs. Um, and there's some really neat stuff in there that I've been sort of trying to figure out a way to bring over into the web world. Um, so that I'll, I'll start, you know, you'll, you'll see that a little bit later on. So this creates a nib service, which is ops view nib um, class. It's going to create an instance of that. The dependencies, what this is here is this will when it creates that, it'll pass in these two values uh, in the constructor. But on the other end of the responder will be <clears throat> the resolved service. So the controller root, which is down here. Uh, the template root. Um, so we're assuming there's an app root that defines the, the root of our application, sort of the application home. And this is, this is actually an inline service. So this is service template root and then you execute this block to get it. It depends on the app root, okay? From here we pull out, we, we get the, the, the service with all its resolved dependencies is the first argument in our block. Um, so there's, there's actually a couple different types of uh, services. There's block, there's class, um, and there's setter. Setter is not really useful. Uh, block is really useful because you can basically execute a block of code. Whatever comes back on the other end of that is your service. <coughs> class just does a lot of swimming for you and figures it out. So uh, we get the parameter, the app root, which was down here, and then we go to subdirectory root template. So it's just sort of pulling in a path, uh, path class directory object um, and resolving that dependency for that. Uh, the responder is, this is also a Coco concept. Um, Coco will, uh, uh, the, the, the UI has, I think they call it a first responder. Uh, and that's basically what all your actions in your UI are calling. So it's a way to say, it's a way to connect your controller without actually naming it as your controller. Um, so down here we have the controller, namespace, uh, service root, so I'm just calling it root, it's a catalyst in that It creates an instance of that class, it depends on the view nib and the model. So one nice feature about breadboard that this illustrates is that you'll notice that the controller depends upon the view, and the view depends upon the controller. So, <clears throat> Breadboard doesn't care. It'll handle the secular dependencies for you. It'll create a sub proxy object and all this kind of stuff so that it just works for you. You don't have to worry about initialization order. You don't have to worry about some maintenance programmer, maintenance programmer coming down a year later and screwing up your, your, your uh, uh, your initialization or anything of that, it all gets handled for you. Breadboard just spreads it all through, and, and it's there. And you don't run into these, you know, recursive, um, <coughs> recursive downward spirals. Um, so that's basically what that looks like. You could turn the, this is sort of the sugar layer of breadboard. You can make these all into, you know, object calls and construct them yourself, but it'll get tedious. Um, but the basic idea here, the core, the core thing that, that I want you to notice with this is that we're not naming, we're naming our classes in the services. We're saying this is the, this is the concrete class that, this is, uh, that, that I want you to create. But we're, we don't have to name it uh, here. 
We just tell it where to find the service, and what that's an actual instance of is irrelevant to us. So you're wiring all these components together, but you're not uh, you're not forcing yourself to, um, to to name them specifically and be explicit about uh, the, the connections that you have. Um, which, as you start to scale up more and more and more and have bigger and bigger stuff, gets a lot more important. That's one thing about breadboard. It's it's not really as useful for very small applications. You can become overkill or over engineering. Um, in uh, large applications, though, it can be a lifesaver. Because um, the more the more things you have to initialize early on, the less you want to have to worry about the order of that. Um, it takes care of it for you. So, uh, this is uh, this is actually a feature of, of Ox. So um, this is a configuration that Pathrouter can understand. Um, so at the slash, uh, I want you to use the root controller and call the index action, inc root increment dec decrement reset. Um, so these are pretty pretty straightforward here, just telling you which controller and which action to go to. Uh, this gets a little funkier. We've got the set. Uh, and this is basically saying this is a variable called number. Um, and here we say controller, the action set. And then we tell a little bit more about number, basically saying it is an int, which is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very moose ish term there. Um, and it actually uses moose's type system. And it'll validate that. So when, that, when a path that matches this, where this is always, where this is an integer, That'll come through and it'll be fed over to set controller or to the controller root and the action set. Um, so another breadboard thing I want to point out here: it depends on the on the root controller because that's what we're going to be calling in there. Um, this lowercase root maps to that. So I could have actually multiple controllers in here, and I could be telling it in the router spec which controller to go to. Again, I have not told my router what class that controller is, or what it is beyond that, that it's, 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 it's uh, something you can call a method on. It's really all it comes down to. Um, so again, we're using breadboard to not make concrete decisions uh, any sooner than we have to, basically. All this tells us is that you'll find at the end of that service, Something that goes in here and that's compatible with that. That's all it needs to know. It doesn't need to know anymore. So, uh, this is the model. It's just, it's just a moose class, really. It's a counter. That's all it does. Nothing interesting. It's global. Um, it's instantiated in that container. So, here's the controller. Um, it's got the model, it's got the view, there's the index, the increment, we're calling the method in the model, uh, we're rendering the view, deck and reset are basically that, nothing interesting. Set, uh, this is where it gets a little interesting. So when path router uh, uh, resolves these, these routes, it sends it over to these methods and it extracts any arguments that it has. This is just your basic web request, it's actually a black request out here. But it passes any of the arguments that you specified in the previous slide. So here it's set number, maps to lots of this in here. Uh, the number in there. So um, it's very simple wiring uh, stuff together. So uh, here's my template framework, but it's not really because I'm actually stealing a lot from the DB. So this isn't quite a cardinal stick. Um, so uh, I'm pulling out a lot of Cocoa concepts here. Uh, the idea of an applet. Um, so again, you'll notice, you'll notice, start to notice a theme here. Um, it's a type of text. It binds to model slash count. Well, model slash count maps to that model there. Because remember, the controller is the responder. OK? Uh, model slash count method, which is there to get the value. So action type link, it binds to increment. We assume that if you don't have a controller in there, it's the root controller. Uh, the body of the link text, um, 
and you can run through a loop here, so using using TT to, uh, to help you out here. Um, bind to, and this is a different calling convention for the set, to pass in a number, and the value is coming from our TT. Um, so, the, the one thing that I didn't get a chance to do last night, because we were go-karting until so midnight, um, <laughs> was uh, to actually write a test um, about this. So this is theory. I'm not sure this is necessarily true. Uh, my hope is that the more I play with this, um, because I'm not, I'm, I'm not making decisions on what parameters are being passed in, it's just got the responder there, um, and I'm just calling methods on it, uh, and I'm not necessarily making uh, decisions about you know, what I'm calling in order to get my URLs, uh, things like that. My hope is that, these become, that I can make this into something that allows you to build very reusable components. Um, so we will we'll use TT to handle like including the components and looping and all those kind of fun things that you might want that I don't want to have to write. Um, and build on that with these concepts here and then it becomes, in theory, a very testable uh, uh, web framework or uh, template system. Um, but I haven't proved that theory yet. Right? It's too late. Um, so, yeah. Here's the fun part. Um, you put this in your script, your .psgi script, um, and that's pretty much it. Then you get to use um, Blackup, which is, one second. Um, so Blackup is uh, the, uh, a really nice script that's included in Plack that allows you to create your um, you can use it to start up the various back ends of Plaque. So one of the nice things about Plaque is that <clears throat> they took a lot of what uh, Catalyst Engine did, which was to uh, sort of abstract the, the, the uh, details of the web server um, away from you. Catalyst Engine did a pretty good job of it, but uh, WSGI, um, the Python guys, did a really good job of it. And that's where uh, Plaque is borrowing from. So we have, um, what do we have? We have FastCGI, uh, standalone, and standalone pre-forking, um, you got to help me on this, CGI, FCGI, um, there's a PO backend, there's an any event backend, um, so there's all these different uh, backends, and your Plaque application actually doesn't have to care about any of that stuff. Um, it's all abstracted away for you. These things will run your Plaque application, they know how to run it. There's also a mod PSGI. Um, out there for Apache and I think an Nginx plugin. So there's all these ways, and it's basically abstracting away um, the HTTP of it all. Um, you don't have to worry about it. Um, so Plackup also is really useful for testing. So uh, just to explain what we have here, um, so this is just the Perl I to tell it there's my lib, um, uh, port 3000, uh, and then telling it where to get my PSGI um, application. A little bit. Um, could you draw some way down water? Oh, sure. Um, so we've started up a nice little black app. Um, and there it is. We've got our wonderful counter. Um, so with. So remember, we, we, we put this as our little script. That's all we need to do to then hook into the Plaque ecosystem um, and to get all the benefits of the different engines and being able, you know, if I want to test this, I can run it on the local uh, standalone Perl server. If I want to deploy it for real, I might put it on FastCGI and hook up Lighty or Nginx or something like that, or Apache or whatever. Um, Plaque can handle putting together those details for us so I don't have to worry about it. Um, it talks to it in, in the W, well, the, the PSGI spec. So uh, my application speaks PSGI, and all those backends also speak PSGI. That's their common language. They go in there after five minutes. Okay, so um, uh, that's it. Uh, all right. Uh, yay, we can do the 100, 200, minus, minus, minus. Yay, it all works. Um, you said. So um, the nice thing about this is that 
now, I, so not only do I not have to make decisions about my concrete classes and mixing them all together with breadboard and stuff like that, I don't have to make decisions about what I'm deploying this on. I just I can worry about that later. I can just focus on writing my application. And Black Middleware um, uh, gives you even more. Um, and I'll run through this figure. Five minutes here. So, um, so the the great part about Black is the middleware concept. Um, and, and me and Gawa and myself and Matt and Raffle and a whole bunch of people in the Plaque channel <coughs> have been discussing this a lot lately <coughs> and how this also fits in with your Catalyst application, your CGI application, and stuff like that. And so the, the goal and the idea is that Plaque middleware will provide the mechanisms. So uh, here in this example, um, I'm enabling the error document middleware. I'm telling it I want it to be a sub request. So when I hit an error 500 or an error 404, they'll actually redispatch to something at path slash error slash 500 slash error slash 504, and a redispatch in my, my original app will have to handle it. Um, you can also just give it a file name and leave out the sub request, and it'll just send out that file. So, um, Clack will handle this for you. You don't have to worry about that in your app. You can put this in the middleware, and it's pretty straightforward. Sessions. Um, the uh, This will handle cookie, I think the default is cookie based sessions with file storage or is it in memory storage? Okay, so in-memory storage, which you can then move to file storage when you when you go to deploy for real and stuff. So enabling that, uh, the way Plaque communicates with your app is through this large hash uh, called the environment hash. Um, this enables a session within that hash that you can then use. It's a simple hash. I started out making it all very OO and complicated, and then Niagawa went in and simplified the hell out of it to a simple session, which the beauty of that is that it makes no decisions for you, so application frameworks like Catalyst and CGI app and stuff like that can layer what they want over the top of it, but the actual management of the sessions, the cookie writing, um, the, the persistence of the session data, all that kind of stuff, all taken care of for you. You don't have to worry about it. Um, you just lay over the API that you want. Uh, static, handling static files. Um, you know, I'm assuming that there's a service in my app called WebRoot, and I pass that into there. And I tell it anything that matches the matches this regular expression handle is a static file. Again, you can put all this stuff. I didn't have to worry about this kind of stuff in my application. I didn't have to care about error document handling. I didn't have to care about sessions. I didn't have to care about static files. All that kind of stuff that you're going to need in just about any simple web framework. Um, Plot can take care of that for me. I can focus on my application code, which is really what people are paying me for anyway. Um, so, quickly again. Uh, one of the other goals I've had with this is making it very testable. So um, uh, it's very easy to fetch services out of there, test them, see what they do. Uh, path router comes with a test path router module. Um, I can check to make sure that all of these uh, URLs um, are valid for my application. There's also a path not okay, so I can, you know, here's some problems that I might have. This is the reversibility stuff I was talking about. So it's basically saying uh, if I give you this ink, um, you will spit out that it's a controller and the action is ink, and if I pass in the controller and that route spec there, I'll always get that back. So you can test these things, and you can sort of test the um, uh, that, that, that your app is sort of holding together. And Plaque comes with Plaque test, um, test PSGI. This is really powerful because um, this is just sort of a little cargo culty convention that I've taken on. Um, basically, create a web request, uh, get a response. Um, the CV is basically the Plaque application, I think, isn't it? Or is there sort of a harness in here? Uh, it depends on the environment. But okay. It, it does the right thing. It, it comes yeah. like what it does. Okay. It is just in my dispatcher or a mock request for a real server. And in three right. hours, we a go, we'll get inspired and rewrite it to be something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that, that's exactly that. That was my next point is that. It does exactly that. You can tell this to just sort of run, and you can test the content that comes out the other side, or you can tell it that you want to run it, but you want it to run it against the standalone server or or the or, or a live server, and you can do, I guess, in theory, live tests on, on your system uh, this way. So it's a very flexible thing there because you know web applications are royal pain in the ass to test. Um, a, you know, test WW mechanize <clears throat> goes a long way towards it. Um, but this is even building upon that even more. 
Um, so one of, one, of the, one of the things I hate is when you're rushed and you end up and you're like, oh crap, I don't have time to write tests, and you think, I don't really want to write web tests. They should be easy to write. Um, and so, we to our final slide. <laughs> <laughs> I promised Sean that I put this slide in here for him. Um, so this is, this is my question and answer slide. Um, anybody have any questions on my rant and rambling? <laughs> <laughs> Screw you, man. <laughs> Um, is this is this presentation going to be available on the web so that I can try to do this in theory on my own? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll probably I'll probably get uh, the ox up on, on GitHub and I'll put this presentation on as well. On what? Uh, GitHub. Um, I, I don't know what exactly. It is. I'll I'll get it to Chris and he'll put it on the website. Okay. It's um it's a it's a public code hosting uh, website. For and Git, uh, and where where does one um, Get breadboard, uh, path router, moose. All on CPAN. There's this thing called CPAN. Yeah, <laughs> it's all on CPAN. Um, the only thing that's not on CPAN is the office stuff, because um, that's that's you new. Know, it was written like on the plane. And where where does one get the ox stuff? Just so it, it'll be up at some point. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it up there. Uh, can you go to the slide with your router config? No, I, I, I like this slide. No, there. I. I, I <laughs> Um, but I also have an ulterior motive to get that slide off. Yes. Okay, so the set number um, route. Yes. Aren't you worried that there might be a collision between the aux, um, the aux keys that you look at and the router keys? So number could be from aux or from the URL? So there could um, be a collision? No, it, well, uh, this makes a, 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 this sort of, Ox kind of makes an assumption that you have a controller in action. Um, so that those, those are sort of two keys that it assumes are always going to be there. Um, I try to avoid that, but it's a nice concept and it's easy. It's basically saying, you know, this is the class and that's the method I want you to call on. Um, yeah, you could run into issues where you've got name collisions, but ideally you're building it, so you'll keep an eye on it. Uh, in terms of, you know, if you were composing two applications together, um, path router, provides the ability to do that, and it basically merges the two routing specs. Um, and you can you can say, well, I want this and I want this other route, but put it under this URL. So you, you can manage that um, on some levels. I haven't only written a counter in it, man. <laughs> I'm sure I'll run into some problems later on, but I, I haven't, I've gone, gone not, I, I've planned out sort of a blogging, because that's also a nice, easy, easy, uh, um, uh, web app to put together, you know, somebody's already figured out the details of blogging, so whatever. Um, and so yeah, we'll see. Okay. Anybody else? No bumping. Two words. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no bumping. Oh, no bumping. Putting go cards. Yeah. No rough driving. No rough driving. driving. Yeah. <laughs> um, Matt, you were like... Well, I'm sorry, give, give, given your amount of time, I'll just, okay. I'll just shorten it to um, an Empire's quote. You're trying to be, say you're not tied to NBC and yet you call your key controller. The only possible response to that is conclusion, don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not... Any good at some decisions, decision? at some point, some decisions have to be made. Um, and, and so, in this, I'm making the decisions with the control and the action. In theory... Um, <laughs> What's this got to do with David Wheeler? <laughs> in theory, you don't have to. <laughs> you don't have to do that. You, you could, you could probably, you could probably swing it where you weren't doing an MVC, and you could make, make your route spec where it doesn't say controller in action, say whatever the fuck you want. Would you say that this is a leading question? Yes.